A very good morning. Welcome to Daybreak Australia. I'm Hardy Stradwatts in Sydney. I'm Annabelle Drawlers in Hong Kong. We're counting down to Asia's major market opens. Good evening from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. I'm Sherian. The top stories this hour. U.S. stocks and bonds slip as traders cut bets on Fed rate cuts. Governor Chris Waller warning of a cautious approach to reducing borrowing costs. Still, the Fed pivot has big banks calling the bottom on deal making and a drought that's plagued earnings for the past two years. Plus, we wrap up the latest from the World Economic Forum in Davos, where cautious optimism is emerging on the resilience of the global economy. Take a look at how we closed on the Wall Street session because we saw downside pressure with the S&P 500 falling four tenths of one percent. Of course, we had that pushback against uh, the expectations of fast and, and big rate cuts for this year. And we also had some idiosyncratic news, whether it was Boeing being downgraded by an analyst or also the uh, KBW Bank Index under pressure for fifth consecutive session. Of course, we had big banks wrapping fourth quarter earnings, and it was a little bit of a mixed picture. Where you had Goldman Sachs uh, beating expectations when it comes to their uh, profit outlook, but also when it comes uh, to Morgan Stanley, we actually saw them warning about margins when it comes to their wealth business. So we had a Treasuries really reacting to that pushback coming from Fed Governor Waller. So the 10-year yields are passing that 4% level. Uh, we also had the Bloomberg Dollar Index seeing its biggest jump since March. Uh, that also pressuring oil prices, although we pared back on some of those losses because it's really, really cold here in the U.S., and that cold front is now hampering crude production, Bill. Yeah, but Sherry, I think you said the key things for us today in Asia. It is that move that we've seen in Treasury yields coming across from what we've got so far in the Antipodes, the Aussie 10 year as well, just a few basis points higher. And then you've got as well that, that uh, firmer dollar that's playing into the story. And so you do have that Japanese currency weakness uh, still trading around that 147 mark. So uh, higher yields, stronger dollar, these are negatives for Asian equities for the most part. So a lot of futures today are indicating that we'll see uh, markets here opening to the downside. What else we're going to be watching, of course, is, is China's economy. We've got the, the GDP figures due. We've also got the monthly activity numbers and also a Bloomberg scoop on, on how China is planning to deal with all of its economic weakness. So let's just go through some of the key details of that. Uh, very interesting reading. Essentially what we're hearing is that uh, China is weighing more stimulus. So they could actually issue one trillion yuan of new debt. Uh, it's around 140 billion US dollars. It's going to be under a special sovereign bond plan. We've only seen three of those sales in the past 26 years. So last time back in 2020, really that, that COVID era, that COVID response from policy makers. The debt, it's going to be an ultra long repayment period if it does go ahead, but used to fund projects like energy, like urbanization, supply chains, food. These are just some of the key areas that China really wants to, to deal with. And uh, Heidi, of course, we understand they've taken a very strong or large contingent to Davos, China. So it is that message as well that, that China's open for business. Yeah, very much so. Trying to project at least externally confidence at a time where we're seeing uh, internal confidence, domestic confidence, be it you talk about households or businesses uh, in China really starting to suffer, right? And we're talking about this delegation being led by the Chinese Premier Li Qiang at Davos. And he met with a lot of the banking heads. Sherry was just mentioning uh, the outlook when it comes to U.S. banks. And he met with the likes of Jamie Dimon uh, at Davos, amongst others, the heads of J.P. Morgan Chase, Intel, other top global firms to really kind of project this idea that China, despite its ongoing you know, structural slowdown, is open for business. He also uh, talked about the, the GDP achievement, right, really saying that the, the gross domestic product grew around 5.2% uh, in 2023. And, you know, I guess that takes, I guess, some of the wind out of the data that we get today. But uh, I will say, Sherry, that, you know, that GDP number is probably the least interesting out of those indicators that we do get. But take a listen to what we heard from Chinese Premier Li Qiang. Last year, in 2023, the Chinese economy rebounded and moved upward, with an estimated growth of around 5.2%, higher than the round 5% target set at the beginning of last year. In promoting economic development, 
we did not resort to massive stimulus. We did not seek short-term growth while accumulating long-term risks. Yeah, so we've now seen China being able to achieve that growth target of around 5% for 2023. Of course, we'll be looking forward to what their target is for 2024. But talking about resilience in the economy, of course, we continue to see that strength in the U.S. economy. And given the strength of the labor market and other factors, we have heard more Fed officials sort of pushing back when it comes to cutting rates as fast and as in a big manner as markets have expected. There are more thinking of doing it methodically and carefully, according to Fed Governor Waller. Take a listen. With economic activity and labor markets in good shape and inflation coming down gradually to 2%, I see no reason to move as quickly or cut as rapidly as in the past. Right, as the Fed now continues to signal that cautious pivot to rate cuts, Wall Street executives are expecting a pickup in investment banking revenue in the coming months. Finance reporter Catherine Doherty joins us now to wrap up the big banks' earnings. So, Catherine, who are the big winners and losers here? So, this morning we heard from Goldman and Morgan Stanley. Goldman was actually signaling the green shoots, the optimism that they are expecting for a return and investment banking that will be both seen in fees. Um, um, debt and equity underwriting, especially debt, was uh, exceeding expectations for the end of the year. So that actually already indicates that there's some momentum going into 2024. And executives have said that that will continue and potentially get even stronger, especially as you hear more expectations for rate cuts going ahead and investors have more optimism and signs of some sort of security. They're able to work in these interest rates uh, and have some certainty and what they're investing in that could mean a return of deal making um, in a more significant way than what we've seen for the past two years or so. And Catherine, as you mentioned, a lot of the big themes were sort of carried through from, from last year into 2024. Were there anything, you know, any big surprises from the banks? A lot of the results were in line with expectations. I would say that trading, um, especially with fixed income, fell short uh, with many of the banks. Um, but equity trading exceeded expectations. So we saw some, some offsets for Bank of America. Overall, they saw their strongest fourth quarter um, on record. And so even though it was a miss for fixed income in terms of compared to the estimates, um, their equities team exceeded expectations and overall their sales and trading was, was a beat. Um, but oh, another bank that um, had some more detail, um, I wouldn't call it a surprise necessarily because they have signaled this overall restructuring they're going through is Citibank. Um, they gave the specific number of 20,000 roles that they're expecting to cut uh, in the coming year. And that is going to come with some charges that they're going to be dealing with. But what they're signaling is that overall, this is a decision that they're making as they exit certain businesses that have um, pulled down on their profit. They're focused on the things that can be more profitable for the business. Um, and the expectation that Jane Frazier has set out is when they go through this uh, tough period that in the end, they will end up a leaner bank and can focus on serving their clients in how they see um, the the most profitable um, and lenient way forward. Catherine, we had heard from banks being also a little bit more cautious when it comes to the outlook for net interest margins, given, of course, where the Fed is expected to go this year. Were there some consistent themes uh, for this year across the big six banks? For net interest income, uh, many of the banks have signaled that the peak, we, we've seen it, and that uh, for the next two quarters um, in 2024, that it will come down slightly. And then the expectation is that if interest rates come down, um, that other businesses will profit from that. Um, if there is a return to deal making, those revenues will uh come up. Um, so we could see third, fourth quarter NII come back for, or at least stay flat, um, as opposed to a decline that some of the executives are expecting for the first two quarters of 2024. Bloomberg's finance reporter Catherine Doherty here with the wrap-up of big banks' earnings for the fourth quarter. Our next guest says investors already anticipate some economic slowdown, which is now priced into markets. Let's discuss with Margie Patel, senior portfolio manager for multi-asset solutions at Allspring 
Global Investments. Mark, you always great to have you with us. So if the expectation is for a slowdown of whichever magnitude, should we just uh, expect more volatility ahead this year? Well, I think we'll have volatility in the first half of the year. Uh, coming into the, the year, we're seeing fourth quarter earnings reporting, and I think on balance they'll continue to be very good and surprises on the upside. But what I think is more critical is looking ahead in this year, uh, how will companies shave their outlook? And we expect we will see companies uh, have a pretty good fourth quarter, but uh, reduce their outlook for the rest of the year. So we think the market might be pretty choppy as we see the different um, outlooks for the whole year by different companies. Is Zara a risk right now? Because we have seen, of course, these earnings expectations having been lowered cons significantly already. So a beat seems uh, to be the case right now. But when it comes to earnings growth, that could be the challenge. Yes, and I think that will really be another year where companies that have above average growth, sustainable growth, will continue to trade at big market premiums, and companies with low growth or disappointing earnings will uh, continue to underperform. It's sort of the case we had last year, you know, two different worlds, really. Margie, how are you factoring in where the Fed goes from here, given that, of course, we continue to see the pushback when it comes to those aggressive rate cut expectations? Uh, well, we're thinking that the Fed will probably cut one to two times this year, <clears throat> but perhaps it may be in the second half of the year when they see signs of an economic slowdown. And we're not expecting really those cuts to give much of a boost to the economy. Uh, we think the economy has had a, a huge amount of uh, growth because of all the COVID spending, the Inflation Act spending, the infrastructure bill. And we think as, as those monies peter out, we'll see lower growth from the economy overall. Plus, when you look overseas, we're seeing pretty muted growth pretty much around the world. What does that mean for longer term rates at this point, given, of course, that we also have issuance from the Treasury as well? Well, I think that rates are really um, going to be in a trading range. I don't see how longer term rates can really go much below, too much below 4% where they are right now with inflation of, say, 2%. And one of the main reasons is because we simply have such an enormous deficit to be financed. The supply of treasuries must be financed. We must attract buyers. And usually we get a lot of our deficit purchased by foreigners. But many, many foreign countries also have big deficits that they're looking to finance. So I think we may see Treasury rates stay higher than you might think looking at inflation growth and look at the economic growth. So I think 4% is still trading range. Okay. Um, we have also seen China being able to achieve that about 5% growth for 2023. How much will a rebound in demand from this economy help uh, the broader economic and financial picture here in the U.S.? Mm -hmm. Well, we think that Chinese growth is going to decelerate this year. So we're really thinking something more in the range of, say, four to five rather than five or five plus. Uh, we've already seen this year many companies in the healthcare space, in the consumer goods space, uh, refer to dramatic slowdowns in their Chinese sales. So we think that's really reflective of what's going on with consumers in China. So we think the growth from China, particularly as it contributes to the U.S., is going to be muted at best and maybe even uh, decline sales from previous years. We have seen the Bloomberg dollar index also continuing to gain ground with it right now seeing the best day since March or so. Of course, we get, as we have been discussing, those conflicting messages coming from the Fed. But if we do have a significantly stronger dollar, what does that mean for all of these U.S.-based companies that do business abroad, that export products and their competitiveness and how, how that applies to really their stock pricing? Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, companies today are so much more flexible that I don't think a stronger dollar is going to really impair their profit margins. Companies have a way of changing where they produce, where they get their supplies and hedging. So I don't think that's going to be a material issue. I think it's really going to be what's the strength of the underlying business, what's their outlook, rather than what the dollar impact is on their earnings. Margie Patel, always good to have your thoughts. Senior Portfolio Manager for Multi-Asset Solutions at All Spring Global Investments. Thank you. Well, coming up next, AI takes center stage at Davos as policy and business leaders discuss the risks and rewards. You can catch our conversations with the IMF Managing Director, Kristalina Georgieva, and Open AI CEO Sam Altman later this hour. 
But first, U.S. forces hit four Houthi missiles in Yemen after attacks on two commercial ships in the Red Sea. We'll get the latest next. This is Bloomberg. The resilience of not just the economies but also financial markets um, to the geopolitical crises that are going on to the rise in interest rates and the fight against inflation has been remarkably strong. There is some wind coming from 23 into 24. The overall sentiment for 2024 is, is positive. We are going into a soft landing. U.S. poised for soft landing. Expect very probably a rate cut this year. We don't think the rates will probably come back down to the levels we saw pre-COVID or pre this interest rate cycle, just because of the level of government debt and spending and the state of the economies across the world. We're in a tight fiscal space at the moment, both for uh, as a result of the global challenges and domestic challenges. The risk of this thing going the wrong way uh, is there and will continue to be there into the foreseeable future. Expect the unexpected. Some policymakers and business chiefs giving us their assessments for 2024 in Davos. Now, one of the headwinds that's shaping up early this year is the chaos in the Red Sea. The U.S. has hit four Houthi missiles in Yemen in what it calls a preemptive strike. Bloomberg's Vani Quinn joins us now with the latest, and this, of course, after a couple of shipping vessels were already attacked. Well, exactly. So American defense officials calling it a preemptive strike, but that just suggests that they might be expecting that there will be more strikes from the Houthi side, because really, these are reactive strikes just as well. Right, Cherry and Heidi? So four... Houthi missiles were used to try and hit commercial ships, and two commercial ships were hit, a Greek-owned commodity carrier and a U.S.-owned bulk freighter. Now, the attack that the U.S. carried out was much more limited than those extensive airstrikes that we saw last week by the U.S. and U.K. bilaterally. And we know that since Friday, the U.S. Navy has advised vessels to stay away from the Southern Red Sea, which effectively closes off the Suez Canal. I think it means that the U.S. was maybe slightly surprised that the Houthis came back as forcefully as they did, as quickly as they did after that group of strikes that we saw. And the uh, upshot is that two more companies have stopped shipments through that area, Shell and also the Japanese shipping giant Mitsui OSK Lines, which has a fleet of about 800 vessels. So it is getting more serious to a degree, and I would imagine the U.S. is hoping that if it continues with these preemptive strikes, as, as they call it, that, you know, maybe the Houthis will stop. They haven't given any indication that they would. Jake Sullivan was at the World Economic Forum in Davos speaking Tuesday. He said, we are not looking for regional conflict, but we reserve the right to take further action because the Houthis can't be permitted to what he said was basically hijacking world trade. Now, on the other side of things, you have the EU getting its act together as well, right? It didn't take part in this bilateral attack on the Houthis. It also didn't support the bilateral attack in the statement where other countries did. And it also didn't get involved in Operation Prosperity Guardian. But now, according to people familiar with the matter, it is moving ahead with plans to establish a naval operation which may or may not be ready by the end of February, which will tell you what these officials are thinking, right? That's, you know, a month and a half away. No details yet on what this naval operation would look like, but the EU is getting down to details and is getting agreement on perhaps sending at least three destroyers or frigates with multi-mission capabilities to the Red Sea. Bonnie, is Iran getting more involved? Well, it's hard to say that it's getting more involved. What it is doing is getting more public, I think, Heidi, it's fair to say. As we know, Iran and Israel have been in this shadow war for decades, basically. But these m militant groups in several countries now with the backing, financial and otherwise perhaps, of Iran are coming to the fore. So we know about Houthis in Yemen, obviously. It was also in Iraq and Hezbollah, obviously, in Lebanon. But just in the last day, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard has taken responsibility for an attack that was carried out on what it says was the Mossad mission in Iraq, in Erbil, in Iraq. This is the first time that Iran has publicly taken responsibility for a bombing like this, a drone strike like this. And so that's a very, very interesting because we know that the militias all have their own reasons, right, for carrying out the kinds of attacks that they're carrying out. They're not, they're not Iran's proxies. They're also their own 
peoples with their own targets and so on. They just may have Iran's backing. But that is an interesting one to watch because Iran says it was in retaliation for the assassination in Syria by the US of one of its senior leaders. And so we'll have to see if there's more tit for tat in that regard, if the US or Israel or somebody else decides to respond to Iran after it publicly claimed responsibility, then that will be a different story. Bloomberg's Vani Quinn there. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky is calling for more international aid and investment in the face of the ongoing conflict with Russia. Speaking with global and financial leaders in Davos, Zelensky called Vladimir Putin a predator and said strengthening Kyiv would, quote, strengthen your security. In a bid to boost financial support for Ukraine, he also met with Jamie Dimon of JP Morgan, Blackstone boss Steve Schwartzman and the Bridgewater founder Ray Dalio. Well, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg says the U.S. will stay in the military alliance regardless of this year's elections and the threats by Donald Trump to exit. He spoke with Bloomberg at Davos, detailing the group's spending hikes over the past decade and the importance of keeping up support for Ukraine. Well, the good news now is that allies are uh, investing uh, more uh, over the last uh, few years. We have seen so do you think this was a wake-up call? Absolutely. The, uh, so first of all, we made an important decision in 2014 uh, when uh, Russia went into Ukraine the first time and annexed Crimea and took parts of uh, East Donbass. Then we actually agreed in NATO to uh, start to increase our defense spending. And since 2014, allies have increased uh, the defense spending substantially. But after the full-fledged invas invasion in 2022, of course, they uh, start to do even uh, more. Uh, and, and the result is that now more and more allies are spending 2% uh, of GDP or even more on defense. Um, uh, we have in total added uh, 450 billion extra US dollars for the defense across uh, Europe and Canada. And they are investing in advanced uh, weapon systems, F-35s, uh, air defense systems, uh, both to protect NATO territory, but also to be able to continue to provide supplies uh, uh, to Ukraine. So what is the ask specifically from Zelensky? His ask is to get uh, more uh, weapons and uh, more uh, sustainment of those weapons. So this is about you know deploying new new uh, batteries, air air defense batteries, uh, artillery, and so on. But this war is now becoming a war of attrition, meaning that it's not only about deploying new systems, but also ensuring that we have enough ammunition, that we have not sp enough spare parts and maintenance. And allies are doing exactly that. Uh, we're also working with the uh, Ukrainian defense industry to help to. Increase increased production inside Ukraine. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg with Bloomberg's Admarie Hordern. We have more to come on Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg. AI is a brilliant tool uh, for people to be more productive. Now, it means the bad guys will be more productive so they can do more cyber attacks, so they can design weapons. You've got to make sure the best AI for cyber defense or you know measures to defend against bioterrorism are in the hand of the good guys. And you know it, it's a challenge, but you know, people sometimes lose sight of the fact that this is the biggest productivity advance in, in our lifetimes. Bill Gates is speaking about AI at the World Economic Forum meeting taking place in Davos. Australia's government will consider introducing mandatory guardrails on the development of AI in what it calls high-risk settings. It's planning to establish a panel of experts to weigh options for restrictions on the technology. An earlier review found that voluntary restrictions on AI development were insufficient with potential inaccuracies, biases and a lack of transparency. The IMF Managing Director, Kristalina Georgieva, is also raising concerns about the risks of artificial intelligence. She spoke with us at Davos about how the technology could adversely impact labour markets and financial stability. 60% of jobs in advanced economies over a foreseeable future are going to be impacted by artificial intelligence. And they would be impacted in one of two ways. If you're lucky, artificial intelligence will enhance your productivity, make your job more enjoyable, and very likely better paid. 
If you are unlucky, your job is gone. The United States is putting a lot of money into this. China's putting a lot of money into this. They might not have all of those prerequisites, but they do have a lot of money that they're funneling into the development of this. Does that make your job harder? Because there's almost a new arms race between the most powerful nations that are all member states of the IMF. Uh, what is making our job harder are two risks that come with artificial intelligence. One, increase of inequality. The world is already so unequal that it impacts the fabric of societies and it spills over in protests on the streets, in lack of trust in governments. And artificial intelligence, unless this is attended, is going to deepen inequality. Uh, those workers that would see their jobs enhanced, they'll make more money. But those that see their jobs gone, if there is no social safety net for them, uh, they're going to be in deep trouble. And then across countries, inequality would grow. The second big risk we see uh, from our perspective is on uh, financial stability. Why we are concerned about that? Because artificial intelligence can lead to manipulation of data, uh, of prospectives for, uh, for companies and countries in a way uh, that we have not seen so far. So uh, what does it mean? Well, it means that uh, uh, governments have to wake up and take this very seriously. Uh, at the moment, I don't think they, they do. I don't think that they're looking at their level of preparedness seriously and then doing what is necessary to step up. But especially to figure out what do you do? How do you regulate something that changes so rapidly? And how do you regulate it to bring the risks of misinformation, disinformation down, but grab the productivity benefit? IMF Managing Director Kristalina Gorgieva speaking with Bloomberg's Lisa Abramowitz in Davos. Let's stick with AI and unpack some more insights from Davos. Annabelle joins us from Hong Kong. Bell, so there's been a really big focus on the technology itself, but also intellectual property rights. Yeah, this is really becoming quite a significant flashpoint between big tech and between media companies as well, because it's really about trying to understand more how these large language models are being developed, the sorts of data that they're using as well. Uh, so we know, for instance, that the, the owner of Salesforce, this is Mark Benioff, uh, he is also the owner of Time. And we, we understand from our Bloomberg reporting that Time is among the, the publications that's now negotiating with ChatGPT maker or owner OpenAI to, to license their news work. We've also heard other companies include uh, Discovery Inc., CNN, Fox, Warner Brothers as well. So there's a number of different media companies that are perhaps trying to get uh, value from their data. They're saying that perhaps it's been unfairly used to a degree. The New York Times, of course, uh, quite uh, notably suing OpenAI just a few weeks ago for that very reason. So it's something that came up on the sidelines of, of the Davos event, and we heard from Mark Benioff on this very issue. Take a listen. We're all finding our intellectual property, your stories, your work that Bloomberg paid for or Time paid for or New York Times paid for surfacing in these results because all the day training data has been stolen. So Benioff as well said nobody exactly knows how much uh, or what a fair price for this data is. Uh, we've also heard from Sam Altman on this. He's saying it's really not worth that much, but of course they're on different sides of the negotiating table here. Uh, it's interesting to note just the timeline because Sam Altman's presence at Davos has been very much felt uh, one of the key guests that's there. But... Uh, also, the, the, the Microsoft CEO, Satya Nadella, and, and all of this chaos around open AI, it's only just very much in the recent rear view uh, mirror. And so we did hear from him as well how that structure is progressing, if he's getting that sort of outcomes that he's hoping to see at open AI. Take a listen to, to what Nadella had to say, the Microsoft CEO. I'm comfortable. I have no issues with any structure. What we just want is good stability uh, and 
and as I said, we don't even need, like I'm not even interested in a board seat or we don't need, we, we definitely don't have control, we have no, uh, we just want to have a good commercial partnership and we want to be investors in the entity in even uh, the way they're structured. So uh, what I would like is good governance and real stability, mm -hmm. that's it. We also spoke with Nadella about uh, the US election. Yeah, well, this is another key talking point because there is concern around how OpenAI's tools or ChatGPT, other mo models as well, could be really used to, to spread or create misinformation, disinformation campaigns. So approaching any sort of election, uh, not least the US one later this year, is another focus of how these companies plan to handle that. Uh, here's as well what Nadella had to say on this topic disinformation or misinformation uh, and election interference is going to be a real challenge uh, that we all have to tackle. We as a company have to do our best work, right? Whether in the context of AI, uh, we have lots of initiatives around content IDs and other things that will then help us, uh, you know, at least vouch for the veracity of uh, any content out there. And that's, I think, the work that we need to do. But ultimately, uh, in the democratic process, Essentially, ensuring the integrity of elections is one of the fundamental challenges we have to face up to. And as I said, Sam Altman is also someone who's been at Davos this year. He is, as we know, the OpenAI CEO and someone who reflected on, on what the creator of ChatGPT also needs to think about ahead of those polls or that vote taking place. Take a listen. I think there's a lot at stake at this election. I think elections are, you know, huge deals. I believe that America is going to be fine no matter what happens in this election. I believe that AI is going to be fine no matter what happens in this election. And we will have to work very hard to make it so. Um, but this is not, you know, no one wants to sit up here and like hear me rant about politics. So I'm going to stop after this. <laughs> um, but. I think there has been a real failure to sort of learn lessons about what, what's kind of like working for the citizens of America and what's not. There are political figures in the US and around the world, like Donald Trump, who have successfully tapped into a feeling of man, dislocation, uh, anger of the working class, the feeling of you know, exacerbating inequality or a technology leaving people behind, is there the danger that uh, you you know, know, AI furthers those trends? Yes, for sure. I think that's something to think about. But one of the things that surprised us very pleasantly on the upside, because uh, you know, when you start building a technology, you start doing research, you, you kind of say, well, we'll follow where the science leads us. And then when you put a product, you'll say, this is going to co-evolve with society, and we'll follow where users lead us. But it's not, you get, you get to steer it, but only somewhat. There's some which is just like, this is what the technology can do. This is how people want to use it. And this is what it's capable of. And this has been much more of a tool than I think we expected. It is not yet, and again, in the future, it'll, it'll get better. But it's not yet like replacing jobs in the way, or to the degree that people thought it was going to. It is this incredible tool for productivity. And you can see people magnifying what they can do um, by a factor of two or five, or in some way that doesn't even talk to it. Makes sense to talk about a number because they just couldn't do the things at all before. And that is, I think, quite exciting. This, this new vision of the future that we didn't really see when we started. We kind of didn't know how it was going to go. And very thankful the technology did go in this direction. But where this is a tool that magnifies what humans do, lets people do their jobs better, lets the AI do parts of jobs. And of course, jobs will change. And of course, some jobs will totally go away. But the human drives are so strong and the sort of way that society works is so strong that I think, and I can't believe I'm saying this because it would have sounded like an ungrammatical sentence to me at some point, but I think AGI will get developed in the reasonably close-ish future, and it'll change the world much less than we all think. It'll change jobs much less than we all think. And again, that sounds, I may be wrong again now, but that wouldn't have even compiled for me as a sentence at some point, given my conception then of how EGI was going to go. As you've watched the technology develop, have you both changed your views on how significant the job dislocation and disruption will be as AGI comes into focus? You know, you hear a coder say, OK, I'm like two times more productive, three times more productive, whatever, than they used to be. And I like can never code again without this tool. You mostly hear that from the younger ones. But um, it turns out 
and I think this will be true for a lot of industries, the world just needs a lot more code than we have people to write right now. And so it's not like we run out of demand. It's that people can just do more. Expectations go up, but ability goes up too. Open AI CEO Sam Altman there speaking at Bloomberg House uh, in Davos. You can watch us live and catch up on our past interviews on our interactive TV function. That's TV Go. You can also dive into any of the securities or the Bloomberg functions that we talk about. You can join the conversation as well by sending us instant messages during our shows. It is for terminal subscribers only. Do check it out at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. You're watching Daybreak Australia. Here are some of the key global headlines this hour. Some ship insurers are starting to avoid covering U.S. and U.K. merchant ships against war risk in the Red Sea. Professional services firm Marsh says underwriters are seeking exclusions for such vessels when issuing cover for trips through the waterway. War risk rates have gone up in recent days as Houthi militants continued attacks on ships despite airstrikes by the U.S. and U.K. Ports operator DP World says it does not expect the shipping disruptions in the Red Sea to be a long-term problem. Its CEO spoke to us in Davos saying while delays are a concern, global trade will continue even as supply chains remain fragile. Trade is resilient. Trade will continue no matter what. Even when there are at the heat of problems between China and America, trade continued. It cannot stop. People need something. People want to eat. People want to buy. People want to trade. Uh, I expect the, the world to be more calmer. I expect yeah. to be to see people more cooperating with each other, because that's what is needed. U.S. lawmakers are proposing a new tax deal with Taiwan that risks angering Beijing. The measure would reduce withholding taxes on qualified Taiwanese residents doing business in the U.S. The agreement will fall short of a formal treaty, though, as the U.S. does not recognize Taiwan as a sovereign nation. Beijing is sensitive to any moves by Washington it perceives as supporting an independent Taiwan. We've learned European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen and Chinese Premier Li Chang raised their respective EV and liquor investigations during a meeting in Davos on Tuesday. But a source says there was no further discussion. China announced an anti-dumping investigation into some EU liquor products this month. The move was seen as retaliation for the bloc's scrutiny into Chinese EV subsidies. Well, Sherry, while China's post-pandemic recovery disappointed last year, one major money manager says there is cause for optimism. Primavera Capital founder and CEO Fred Hu spoke to us in Davos about the possibility of a rebound in Chinese assets this year. I um, very much hope so, and I think you know last year, as you pointed out, was a dismal year uh, for the markets and for the economy. You know, Chinese economy definitely underperformed. Um, you know, since the uh, COVID uh, reopening. Uh, however, I think the conditions are in place. Uh, you know, the economy is going to be much stronger. Fundamentals are going to improve across the board. Above all, policy uncertainty is going to uh, be reduced. Uh, you know, clearly. So that they will pave the way to arrive our confidence and on top of the dirty cheap valuation across the spectrum. Before we talk about those dirty dirt cheap valuations, I mean, are you then saying that China is back being investable? Because we know when you take a look at foreign funds, they've either cut the exposure to China or made a complete exit from the Chinese market. Are they wrong in doing that? Well, you know, uh, investors definitely uh, saw a lot of uncertainty. They were puzzled or confused by the mixed messages from uh, policy makers and regulators. They also saw the data, uh, you know, how the economy was doing, you know, disappointing. So this combined together, you know, they were net sellers, uh, you know, for much of the last year. Again, right now we are at the kind of inflection point, you know, the, you know, there is evidence you know, the uh, parts of the economy are improving, uh, improving and picking up. And I think, um, you know, to me, the most important thing is the Chinese leadership has at the last, you know, grasped the, um, you know, reality, you know, understand the gravity of challenges they're facing. So I think uh, 
you know, people don't uh, forget, China still has a lot of arsenal, uh, partisan arsenal at its disposal, whether it's uh, monetary or physical or regulatory. From a very capital CEO, Fred Hu, with Bloomberg's Hassan the Amin in Davos. And of course, you can get a roundup of all of the stories that you need to know to get your day going in today's edition of Daybreak. Terminal subscribers go to DayBGo. You can also customize your settings so you only get the news on the industries and the assets that you care about. This is Bloomberg. Watching Daybreak Australia, take a look at some of the top corporate stories that we're tracking this hour. Spirit Airlines shares lost almost half their value after a U.S. federal judge blocked JetBlue's $3.8 billion takeover. The court ruled that the combination would stifle competition. The ruling follows a trial in November where government lawyers argued that the merger would eliminate a key incentive for bigger airlines to offer budget-friendly fares. Uniqlo is suing Shein, accusing the Chinese fast fashion retailer of copying its popular round mini shoulder bag. Uniqlo parent Fast Retailing says Shein operators must immediately cease sales of imitation products and compensate for damages. It's the latest established retailer to sue Shein following rival H&M's lawsuit in Hong Kong last year over alleged copyright infringement. BP is reportedly close to naming its acting CEO, Murray Alkenkos, as a permanent successor to Bernard Looney. Sky News says the announcement could come by Wednesday. He was named interim CEO in September after Looney resigned for failing to fully disclose past relationships with colleagues. Jerry. Heidi, take a look at how markets are setting up for the Asian session. Of course, we have Kiwi stocks already trading right now. Downside for three consecutive days. We have the Kiwi dollar also underperforming against the U.S. dollar. Really that broader narrative where we continue to see dollar strength given the Treasury yields are rising. We saw the Bloomberg dollar index seeing its best day since March. So everything on the other side of the trade is under a little bit of pressure. Same story for the Japanese yen that's topped 147 already again the U.S. dollar and you can see uh, that Nikkei futures are looking to the upside of nine tenths of one percent after falling in the previous session but really to do with where the BOJ goes from here given that of course we do have the central bank decision next week we have already seen data out of Japan showing that input inflation is now starting to flatline and what we'll be watching this week for more clues about where the central bank in Japan goes from here is the CPI report on Friday and the expectation right now is that the Bank of Japan's assessment that that upward pressure on inflation uh, would be short-lived was actually correct. We actually had a uh, Tokyo inflation, Heidi, a leading indicator, of course, for the national trend weakening last month to the slowest pace in over a year. And of course, in South Korea, Heidi, I'll also be watching those chip makers because the recovery in that sector has been pretty patchy. Yeah, we'll be watching that very closely, particularly in light of all of these big conversations about the future of AI, the rewards and risks that are taking place at the moment. But of course, the other two major themes as we get into the second half of January still remains. You've touched on sort of expectations of the BOJ and how, uh, you know, yen traders are not all that convinced in terms of a big change, at least imminently. But a lot, a lot of conversation going on when it comes to Fed expectations and China expectations, right? Well, you spoke earlier about uh, Fed Governor Chris Waller really urging the cutting of rates if and when we get there to be done carefully if we continue to see the sustained cooling in inflation, saying that the Fed should be methodical, careful when uh, the easing begins and there's no need to move as quickly as perhaps the Fed has done so in the past. As long as inflation doesn't rebound and stay elevated, uh, they should be able to lower the target range, uh, but lots of caveats in terms of how that strategy is implemented. And at the same time, one of the other things that we're obviously watching in terms of uh, a potential impact, particularly on the sort of China proxy uh, 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 trading themes uh, like iron ore, like the Aussie dollar, like some of the big miners as well, is what we get out of the domestic activity data dump out of China. GDP, we more or less know what's expected, right? We did hear from Chinese Premier Li Tiang speaking in Davos, um, really saying that the economy grew 5.2 percent or around 5.2 percent in 2023. So no big surprises ever really expected mm. when it comes to GDP, but we will be delving uh, 
pretty deeply into those domestic activity indicators because there is still just uh, uh, so much sort of existential crisis. I think I can say that about where the Chinese economy is headed and you know how that's going to impact its global trading partners, Sherry. Yeah, that's been really interesting because, of course, we have seen Li Chang talk about how we saw that rebound in the economy without using risky or short-term measures like large spending or credit programs. But we have actually seen the PBOC taking more measures recently as well, right, when it comes to shifting some of that responsibility away from local governments. But take a listen to what uh, we heard from Nomura in terms of what the central banks are doing right now around the world. We think that uh, central banks are going to remain vigilant for longer. Uh, I think that uh, they were shocked by this inflation move, and I think they're going to make sure that it's under control before they move forward. So our view on the market is perhaps uh, that, in, that interest rate cuts come a little bit later. So again, uh, surprise, surprise, the main theme of 2024 turns out to be where central banks go from here, whether it's a PBOC or the Fed, <laughs> the RBA, and of course we have the BOJ next week as well. That's it for Daybreak Australia. Daybreak Asia is next. This is Bloomberg.